Um, yeah, so heads up, we will be recording this meeting. Um, and yeah, I can get get us started with a few introductions here. Um, so this is the public meeting for the Bosper's Tracking and Accounting Standard Operating Procedures Methodology. Um, I am Helen Carr, and I am the non-point source coordinator here at the Vermont Department of Environmental Conservation. And I am working with Emily here and all these folks in the room um, in the Clean Water Initiative Program. And so I will let Emily introduce herself and she'll get started with the first few slides and then I'll jump in later on. Hi everyone, thanks so much for joining us today. This is a second public meeting in a public meeting series that we had this week on some materials that are posted for public comment now through May 2nd. Uh, my name is Emily Bird. I am the Clean Water Initiative Program Manager here at the Vermont Department of Environmental Conservation. For today's agenda, we're going to give an overview of the agenda first and kick us off with an overview and history of our Vermont Clean Water Initiative and the Clean Water Service Delivery Act that we call Act 76 of 2019. Uh, and then Helen is going to provide an overview of the draft phosphorus accounting standard operating procedures. And then we'll give an overview of the public notice and comment period that is ongoing. Uh, going over the timeline and how to comment, and then we'll open it up at the end for public comment. And linked there are um, the details for today's public meeting and the presentation slides are posted online if you would like to follow along that way. And maybe we can drop that link in the chat. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Rachel. Um, next slide. Uh, so Vermont has great Water resources, we're very fortunate. Uh, Vermonters and visitors alike enjoy these resources and all the different benefits that they provide. Uh, socioeconomic, uh, recreational, drinking water, uh, habitat, you name it. Um, and so we're very fortunate to have excellent water resources in our state. However, there are some water quality challenges that we are working to address. Uh, uh, nutrient pollution being one of the front runners, priority pollutants that we are working to address. And due to the rural nature of our landscape, much of the pollution is delivered to our waters through rain runoff and snow melt runoff. Uh, and we're working to address nutrient pollution uh, in our freshwater systems, Lake Champlain Basin on the western side of the state and Lake Memphremagog in the northeast corner. Uh, phosphorus is the limiting nutrient and the nutrient of concern that when in excess, excess and unbalanced in the natural system, it can lead to harmful and sometimes toxic cyanobacteria blooms pictured in the lower right photo. Um, and today we're going to be talking specifically about methods that we have put into place through a collaborative effort to be able to estimate the phosphorus pollution reductions associated with clean water projects that are implemented and constructed on the ground. Act 76, which we'll get into a little bit more later, also in, includes or uh, requires us to establish a schedule by 2023 to extend this framework to cover other pollutants of concern. And so that's a future milestone that we will we'll be working. But today's focus is really on phosphorus impacting Lake Champlain and Lake Mem for Maycock. And these efforts uh, to reduce phosphorus pollution and achieve the, the right balance of those nutrients in the system are guided by uh, clean water restoration plans known as total maximum daily loads or TMDLs for short. Uh, and these plans identify the maximum amount of a pollutant that a water can receive and still meet the Vermont water quality standards. So all of the work we're talking about today is guided by these phosphorus TMDLs for Lake Champlain and Lake Memphremagog. Next slide, please. And back in 2015, the state put together an uh, all in for clean water commitment uh, that was put into statute as nicknamed as the Vermont Clean Water Act or Act 64 of 2015, acknowledging that there are important actions that need to be taken across all of the land use sectors from wastewater to paved surfaces in our developed landscape, our road network, agricultural lands, and forest and stream restoration. So working across all these land uses uh, is really important for us to be able to meet our water quality targets. 
and to provide some reasonable assurances that we would be making progress across all these areas. The TMDL or the Vermont Clean Water Act, excuse me, established some water quality regulations. The state's first clean water fund to provide financial resources to support these efforts and put into place tracking and accounting and reporting requirements so we can keep track of what we've accomplished and identify where we need to do more. And so today's talk is really focused on the tracking, accounting, and reporting mechanisms that we've put into place over the last five to six years. And complementary to the Vermont Clean Water Act is the Lake Champlain Total Maximum Daily Load Accountability Framework. And this is a framework that really holds us accountable to implementing the phosphorus reduction targets that are outlined in the Lake Champlain TMDL. And part of the process is the state tracking and reporting on our progress, and then the Federal Environmental Protection Agency, or EPA, checking in uh, every two and a half years for each of the sub watersheds that flows into Lake Champlain, checking in and, and issuing a report card on whether we're meeting our goals or where we need to be doing more to meet our goals. And that calendar or schedule is on the right hand side of this slide. And basically how this process works is we have a five year tactical basin planning schedule or cycle that each of these watersheds where uh, the TMDL establishes our high level phosphorus targets. Tactical basin planning identifies what those five year interim phosphorus planning targets are for each of these watersheds. And then the basin plans also identify priority actions that are necessary for us meeting those five year planning targets. As those actions are implemented, we track them through our funding and regulatory programs, and we estimate the pollution reduction value associated with those actions. And then we measure our progress against the TMDL baseload where we started and the targets where we need to be in order to achieve water quality standards. And the interagency clean water initiative was also established as a result of Act 64 uh, in 2015 where we work together across state agencies. And we also have some really important federal partners like the US Department of Agriculture and the Lake Champlain Basin Program and the Environmental Protection Agency that are, are helping us along the way as well, uh, where we work together across state agencies through the Clean Water Board's annual budget process to allocate funding uh, to implement this work. And then we rely on the tactical basin planning process uh, to identify priorities, and our targets and direct where we should be implementing these funds. And then we work across agencies, across land use sectors, across our many different partners involved on the ground to implement projects that improve water quality across all of the different land use sectors, from agriculture to addressing stormwater from developed lands and roads, uh, to restoring our natural resources, and to addressing wastewater treatment facility sources of phosphorus. And then each year we also work together across agencies to bring all these data back together and to produce the annual performance report that is really a compilation of all of the state's investments in clean water, the results of those investments, and then it provides some accountability on how we're doing and meeting some of these pollution reduction goals. And then to finish us off here with our background, the Clean Water Service Delivery Act Act 76 of 2019 is complementary to the Vermont Clean Water Act, Act 64 of 2015, and it followed up by uh, achieving some really important milestones, including establishing long-term clean water funding sources for our state's clean water fund, establishing some new funding mechanisms to help get these dollars out on the ground, including the water quality restoration formula grants uh, that we talked about on Tuesday's public meeting, that are awarded to clean water service providers. Uh, it also provides some additional assurances through these funding mechanisms that we will meet the non-regulatory phosphorus reduction targets. Uh, in other words, the actions that are needed to meet the TMDL phosphorus reduction requirements, but are not compelled or driven by regulatory programs. It also provides for the first time some funding and oversight related to project operation and maintenance, which is really important to make sure that these projects endure and continue to perform long term. And then finally, uh, it formalized our process for establishing interim targets uh, and some enhanced accountability around how we are uh, tracking our progress relative to our targets. 
now I'm going to hand it over to Helen to give you an overview of our draft phosphorus tracking and accounting methodology. Great, thanks Emily. Um, yeah, I'll kind of have a great background and I'll kind of narrow our focus now to the how we're, how and why we're tracking and accounting. Um, so we estimate pollutant reductions associated with clean water projects in order to provide this in incremental measures of accountability. And we refer to this process as the TM as TMDL tracking and accounting. Um, so as many of you are probably familiar, we model phosphorus reductions at the individual project level rather than measuring individual phosphorus reductions from each project that has been installed. Um, so when we're talking about um, tracking and accounting, when we're talking about tracking, we're kind of just referring to the, the collection of data on clean water projects. So we collect all kinds of data, but the, the data here that are important are um, things like what watershed is it in, what land use is it on, kind of how large the practice is or the storage volume is, and then what is the area that's being treated by a practice. Um, and when we refer to accounting, we are referring to kind of the modeled estimation or the calculation of nutrient or sediment reductions from a clean water project. So <clears throat> this is kind of a, this little graphic here is kind of a generalized approach um, that we might use to um, calculate phosphorus load reductions. So in the graphic, we can see that we use, oops, forward. Um, <clears throat> um, so we start with a baseline site phosphorus load. So that is calculated using the product of a baseline TMDL loading rate. So the, our TMDLs provided us with different loading rates for different land uses, um, and they were modeled under that TMDL. Um, so we, we now take those loading rates and we multiply them by the site area for a particular practice. And then we take that product and we multiply it by a BMP phosphorus reduction efficiency. And that's something that we, um, we calculate or we gain from literature values or, um, yeah, it's based on or local research that we have. So multiply all that together, we come up with an estimated amount of phosphorus removed. Generally, we report on that in um, a kilograms per year unit. And so we use the results of these tracking and accounting um, to re report in our Clean Water Initiative Performance Report, and that goes back to the Vermont legislature as well as back to EPA to show our progress. And diving a little bit more into our tracking process. Um, this looks like a lot right here, and it is it is quite a lot of information that's coming in, but um, what we do is we collect data, you know, not only from our own funding programs within the Clean Water Initiative program, but we also collect external data from external funding programs that are also implementing clean water projects, such as the Agency of Agriculture, Farm and Markets, uh, Agency of Transportation, even federal funding programs such as NRCS, or the Lake Champlain Basin Program. And we take that information Combine it with other data from regulatory programs, and all of that is funneled into our centralized clean water reporting framework, which we sometimes call QUIRF. Um, and within that framework, um, there are tools embedded in the in that database to be able to calculate phosphorus reductions for each of these different types of projects. So that is our centralized database, and we use that to pull um, information, figures, graphs for the performance report, as well as um, different online tools such as the Clean Water Interactive Dashboard and the Clean Water Project Explorer.
Um, so I want to tell you a little bit more about kind of our development process and how we got to this point where we're at, where we have these long documents with with draft methodologies. Um, so starting in 2015, actually with Act 64, um, it it kind of started the requirement that we establish a tracking and accounting for the Lake Champlain TMDL. Um, and subsequently, the Lake Champlain TMDL was kind of revised to add in this new accountability framework that Emily had touched on earlier in the presentation. So along with that, EPA hired um, a consultant to help us set up a BFP accounting and tracking tool, or um, BAT, we sometimes call it. Um, so that's like basically one of the methods that we use, one of the, the tools that we use to, um, to calculate our phosphorus reductions, specifically for um, storm water practices and buffers as well. Um, so from there, we have been working with um, these various working groups on on establishing tracking and accounting methodologies um, and building those methodologies into our database, into our centralized database, so that we can be able to calculate them and, and report on them. Um, so by, act, by, by 2019, um, Act 76 really um, kind of, uh, I don't know, it, it basically established a more stringent requirement to publish the, the, the methodologies that we have been using to calculate the pollutant reductions. Um, so from there and up until present day, we have been continued to work with um, these various working groups in the fields of agriculture, natural resources, and developed plants to be able to bring you the the final methods that we have, at least as of today. That's a little bit of the history. Um, and I guess to clarify what I mean by the tracking and accounting working groups, um, we have several working groups that we've been working with for many, for, for quite a few years here. Um, so for example, in the agricultural working group, we work the we have members from um, CDC, as well as the Agency of Agriculture, Farm and Markets, as well as members from NRCS, and also EPA has um, been involved in that work group as well. Um, so, yeah, we've established tracking of the agricultural conservation practices through both the regulatory and funding programs that they are. Um, or we're able to, to track information both from funding programs as well as regulatory programs. Um, we've worked with them to um, collect literature and expert panel values um, in order to incorporate those into our methodology. Um, and in some cases, we even contract with experts in the field to help us best determine the, what are the best methods to use. Uh, similarly, in the developed land sector, when we say de developed lands, we mean kind of both the stormwater sector and the road sector. Um, we have a tracking and accounting work group that includes members of DEC, which includes our Clean Water Initiative program, as well as folks from the stormwater program. And we also work with um, the Agency of Transportation. And we've contracted with consultants there as well. Um, so, yeah, similar. We we um, in the developed plans sector, we have uh, both regulatory programs and funding programs that we need to track and account for. Um, and we have used a combination of local studies um, that have that have been in the published literature. And we've also contracted new studies in order to be able to finalize some of our some of our last um, 
different types of projects in that sector. Um, and under the natural resources work groups, there's there's quite a few different subgroups there. So we have a subgroup focused on forest roads, um, which includes members from DEC and the Department of Forest Parks and Recreation, as well as some consultants to help us finalize those methods there. Um, we also have a functioning floodplains initiative or FFI uh, work group that includes members from DEC as well as a group of consultants that we've been working with for a couple years now um, in order to help us develop how to track and account for um, things like stream restoration projects, floodplain restoration projects, wetland restoration projects, and similar. Um, so that's an exciting new uh, new methods coming out there. And then we have worked with the Lake Shoreland program in order to um, establish some methods around specifically around lake shores and uh, the shoreline specifically. Um, yeah, so these in the natural resources sector. Mainly, we are tracking them through state funding programs. There aren't as many regulations in this area. Um, but we have worked with different consultants to assist in the method development there. Okay, so do the documents. Um, uh, so there are several things in each of the documents kind of the introduction of each of the documents that I just want to touch on. So one is the purpose. The purpose of the document is really to outline the current methods used to track and account for phosphorus load reductions in Lake Champlain and Lake Mokromega. Um, and I'll reiterate that the that phosphorus reductions cannot yet be estimated for areas outside of Champlain and Mokromega because methods um, those methods would involve estimating total nitrogen load reductions, and that is kind of a whole different ball game <laughs> um, to estimate nitrogen. We don't yet have the methods to do that yet. Um, so yeah, also note that this document is intended to be updated as new information becomes available or if new research is conducted. It is somewhat of a working document, even though we do need to have it, have a, it published. Um, so we do plan to review these methods um, for accuracy at least once every five years, but it certainly could be updated more frequently than that. And meaning they're subject to change. And then I will just provide a brief um, overview of the document structure. So um, if you have looked at these SOPs, you'll know that each begins with a tracking and accounting, accounting summary table. Um, and so I have clipped a piece of the natural resource tracking and accounting summary table here. So each of them includes all of the different project types within that um, sector, the definition and the practice standards for that practice. Um, the data requirements needed to calculate phosphorus reduction, um, the, a brief definition of what area is treated, um, and then the, the total phosphorus load reduction efficiency values that we have established, and also an estimated or anticipated design life or a lifespan of the project. Um, and then also each document goes into a description of how practices are tracked, either through funding or regulatory programs. Um, and then from there, um, each document dives into a detailed phosphorus accounting methodology by individual practice type or individual project type. And that's where we kind of go into references to the literature as to where we got these values and um, why we chose the values that we did. That went to the next slide. Okay, so 
Um, uh, yeah, that's that's kind of what I was going to say about the SOP documents, um, and I'll just provide you with a quick overview of the public comment process that we are currently in. So we did post these on public notice on March 28th, and the public comment goes through May 2nd. So from there, we will um, respond to, we'll kind of collect, we'll collect any comments that we received today and combine them with any comments, that, any written comments that we received through the environmental notice bulletin. And we will provide a response summary to those comments and work to finalize the methods. So we hope to do this by July at the latest um, in order to be able to have external online tools to be able to calculate phosphorus reductions um, where, yeah, where that's needed. Um, so a little bit about how to comment. Um, again, comments are due by May 2nd. Um, comments must be submitted, written comments must be submitted through the Environmental Notice Bulletin, and that is due to a statutory requirement to follow Type 3 procedures for public comment. Um, if you are familiar with the ENB or the Environmental Notice Bulletin, you can search for this um, entry by selecting the Water Investment Division and then select quantification of pollutant reduction. As you can see in this little yellow box here, if you check those, it should bring you right to the page. Um, if you want more instructions on how to use the ENB, you can go to the Clean Water Service Delivery Act webpage, and there is a public notice section there with more information. Uh, some of the information you'll find there is this um, it includes instructions for submitting comments through the ENB. Um, uh, yeah, I, I'll note that it is required that you submit um, comments through the ENB. So uh, <clears throat> in some cases, Um, so an account with ENB is not required in order to comment, but if you would like to attach any documents to your submission, you should go ahead and create an account there. Um, we have suggested submission templates on the website as well in order to organize your comment, and those would be helpful for you to submit. Um, if you are, if you're writing a comment, especially if it's a longer comment. Um, yeah, so let us know if you have any questions on that. And that is all I have for today. So I think we can open it up for public comment. Yep, there was just one question in the chat from Jill. I, um, can you please explain the total phosphorus reduction efficiency a bit more? What's the baseline or starting point? Thanks. Yeah, for sure. Um, so the the phosphorus reduction efficiency part is is usually just the percentage. So I guess it's it might be helpful if you think about an example. Um, if you have a kind of a stormwater bioretention practice, um, we we know that it's, there's a certain amount of of runoff or runoff containing pollution that's going to that practice, but we know that the that practice is going to treat or remove um, a certain percentage of the phosphorus. Um, and that might be in the form of sediment or other ways. Um, so the, the, the phosphorus reduction efficiency is that percentage of reduction on average that we would estimate that would be removed from that treatment of that practice. And and the TMDL uh, gives us those base loads. The baseline starting point, Jill, is based on um, 
how much, how many kilograms per year phosphorus we expect to run off from, say, a parking lot or an ag field. The TMDL modeling gave us those baseline phosphorus loading rates. And then this percent reduction efficiency gets applied to that for the area that that practice is treating. So in Helen's example, stormwater treatment practice treats runoff from a certain drainage area. And or uh, let's say if you're doing cover crop on an acre of, of ag land, then it, that drainage area or treatment area would be that acre of cover of, of crop land that's that's being cover cropped. Um, so in that that efficiency is an annual average reduction to be consistent with the units used in the TMDL. So we hope that helps to answer your question, but happy to uh, answer any follow up questions. Thank you. Um, Jill, you have your hand up. Oh, actually, Jill, before you get started, I might just say uh, happy to answer any clarifying questions about the presentation and then uh, and then we can open it up for uh, recording public comment. So um, Jill, do you have a clarifying question about the presentation? Yes, I have two more questions. I don't think I have any comments because you're a little bit over my head. Sorry, I'm asking pretty basic questions here. But um, the um, I think in the Clean Water Service Delivery Act, um, it said you're going to create this magic tool for us uh, where we're able to estimate the phosphorus reductions of any project that we would be proposing. Is that going to be basically sort of an online tool where we just plug in the data points that you highlighted in? in your example slide, and then it'll spit out a number and we'll say per the DEC database, the estimated phosphorus reduction is X. Is that what it's going to look like? Good. Well, that's exciting. Yeah, yeah I think so. I that's think the um, that's the, yeah, that's kind of the goal. We have an initial um, calculator tool for stormwater treatment practice, which we call the FTP calculator. Um, so that's really it. Yeah, it asks you exactly which fields um, we need to know in order to be able to calculate it, and then it it, it does spit out a phosphorus reduction value um, for for that particular project. So um, yeah, it will be some. It will be a tool like that where you enter a certain amount of data, and and we will estimate. Um, the phosphorus reduction from that. Um, that will be really handy. I mean, I, I asked in the last meeting, so you don't have to answer this. I'm just sort of repeating it because you weren't here. Maybe Helen was about the opportunities for sort of variability based on geographic or social or geologic or built infrastructure conditions where there could be some significant variation from the average um, for a particular project. So you'll probably hear us when we get into the devil into the details, saying those kinds of things in meetings when we're getting to the project level. Like this is very different because that that that. Um, <laughs> so that's just a sort of follow. -up. I have I have one more question, if, unless somebody else has. So just to respond to that point real quick, uh, the TMDL, depending on where the project's located and the land use characteristics associated with the project. Uh, we may have the ability to pick up on some of the variability that you're you're discuss or you're mentioning there. So that at the project level, tracking and accounting, those factors are kind of able to be baked in to a certain degree. But you're you're totally spot on that there's site specific considerations that go above and beyond what we may be able to track and model, and, and that's important to factor into the decision making around what projects are prioritized. So appreciate that. Yeah. That yeah, that's a good point, Emily. Yeah, right. So, you know, obviously everybody will be able to see the score, scores, which will be a really good plot for the project ranking process. And then we'll just have a bullet or something for other factors. Um, my other question was um, the system that you're developing here, is it going to be used unilaterally by all agencies for their phosphorus reduction estimates? Because you know, right now we have like one agency is using this measure and another agency seems to be using that measure and different agencies. And we're, you know, and it, 
depending on what the program is, we're using different measures. I'm just wondering whether you aim to, uh, you know, sort of unify that and have everybody using the same system. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, the, the part of the reason that we're doing this is really is we do want to standardize how we're accounting for phosphorus across the board um, so that we can kind of compare apples to apples with what each agency is doing. Um, and, and so, so far, with, when we develop our annual clean water performance report, um, we are gathering all the data that we need and then we are calculating um, the same way across the board. So we do, you know, collect data from the agency of ag and we collect data from the agency of transportation and we are using these methods that we've documented in these, um, in these SOPs here. Um, and so it is a standard, it's standard across the board. And we've been fortunate that the Vermont Clean Water Act set the stage for that level of interagency coordination to take place. And we're really grateful for that partnership. And in addition, we're fortunate to have some federal partners who've been willing to engage in the data compilation process. Uh, for example, Natural Resource Conservation Service uh, has a, adapted our approach and relies on us to produce their phosphorus reduction estimates. Um, and so that's great that we're all on the same page and communicating the same outputs and outcomes when we're re applying these results in our communication. So that's a, a valuable component, but of course there's still some work to be done in terms of standardizing, gaining some efficiencies on the tracking side. And I think Jill, um, a, a piece of it that you might be flagging is like standardized reporting templates to make the lives of our partners a little bit easier in, in reporting back to us. So that's something that uh, we can work to uh, continue to make progress on moving forward, hopefully. Thank you. Hey, any other questions on the presentation? Okay, do we have anybody who wishes to comment? We will record your comments and um, include them in the summary of public comment that will produce after the public comment period closes on May 2nd. Feel free to raise your hand or indicate in the chat if you'd like to comment. All right. I'm not seeing anyone, but if if you're having trouble using the chat or raise hand feature and you want to unmute and jump in, feel free to do so. I know we had one person signed up ahead of time, but I don't think they're able to. So it has yeah, so. <laughs> this may be a short one. Right. Well, like Helen said, there are instructions on how to submit written comment available on the website. Uh, if you'd like to use that format to share your feedback with us, we welcome your input and really appreciate your time in attending this public meeting and any time you spend offline reviewing the documents and providing us with your feedback, it's much appreciated. If you have any questions about the public comment process, uh, feel free to contact our program. And there's some uh, contact information on the website that was linked. And we will be posting these minutes and the recording of this meeting on our YouTube channel. Thanks so much, everyone, for being here. Have a great weekend. Enjoy the sunny afternoon. Thank you. Have a great weekend, folks. Thanks. Thanks, Amy. What do you want?